Dr. Mark Changizi here with your Science Moment. Today I'm going to talk about some signs of mass hysteria, sort of things that you might just look at and that suggest, yeah, this is more than just people disagreeing about an argument. There's one side which seems to be deeply involved in a kind of narrative that they can't seem to get out of, and this is what I've been claiming all along in these last 50 or 60 videos, um, trying to help us wrap our heads around the kinds of uh, fundamental mechanisms that drive these kinds of mass hysteria uh, that we're in now. But uh, here's some kinds of signs that you see, and I think that you'll you know, agree with me that these are not normal things that people do unless they're in a mass hysteria. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you're arguing with folks um, on the COVID hysteria side who believe that COVID is disproportionately dangerous and all of the interventions work and so forth, um, they'll say, I follow the science. Now, I've never said that to my opponent, opponents. You know, like, um, of course, I know that they have scientists on their side, but it doesn't seem to occur to most of them in these arguments that there's actually scientists on the other side that may not be on CNN as much. The very idea that they're saying, I, I mean, at least I follow the science. This kind of belief that they really are entirely on the side of science and the other, the opponents are not, is itself signs that they're in a mass hysteria. It also doesn't help that they seem to believe there's such a thing as the science, something we've talked about many times before. There is no such thing as a centralized uh, or consensus notion of science, which they seem to want to always refer to the consensus and the science. And that's not the case. So that's one sign. Related to that is uh, they'll say, well, that's not science, that's a conspiracy theory. They'll just label you and paint you and tarnish you as having a conspiratorial view that is some kind, of, and it may not even be the kind of thing that could be a conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theory concerns uh, the hypothesis, which is typically incredibly complicated, which involves all of these different sorts of people involved in organizing secret you know, uh, uh, plans to, to carry off something. And what we're arguing is that, no, like actually COVID, here's exactly how dangerous it is. And here's how well or not well the interventions are working. Here's just, you know, here, here, there's nothing conspiratorial about it. Now, I argue there's folks on my side that think that there are actually conspiracies behind this in terms of the initiation of uh, these events, and there's not. Um, a third kind of part of this is that there's, there come to be monks or clerics, which are the only people that are allowed to talk about the issue. And these quickly, back in March, became the epidemiologists. And if you're not an epidemiologist, they'll say, well, you're not an epidemiologist. You're not even allowed to talk about this. And of course, these are complex, ridiculously complex societal level costs and balances um, between health of a respiratory virus and all of the other health factors, as well as all of the socioeconomic factors that are involved, not to mention that there are civil rights and ethical issues. These are things that epidemiologists Epi ep there's no, nothing unique about epi epidemiologists that make them the ones that should be the only ones to talk about this. Furthermore, if the person who's the person who's arguing, hey, you're not an epidemiologist, you're not the right kind of monk to, to talk about this, well, they aren't an epidemiologist either. So I was like, well, why are you in this argument yelling at me that I'm not an epidemiologist when you're not either? So uh, if I'm supposed to shut up, why are you even talking? All right, so that's a third kind of weird asymmetric sign uh, that there's some kind of weird thing going on. There's only these clerics of the right kind of cult that, that are allowed to speak. Now, another one is that very, since the very start, there were all of these interventions that were proposed, and it was impossible to talk to them about the cost-benefit analysis. If you presented them, look, look, hey, maybe lockdowns work, maybe they don't, and I had these, you know, I, I've been arguing that lockdowns wouldn't work for, for, for since the very start, but the whole point of these arguments is, do they narrowly work at all? And if they, even if they do work, how well they, do they work compared to the potential costs and the costs are potentially, we knew then, and now we uh, have seen it in real life, are devastating. But if you said this, th that you were deemed a denier, you were actually called a denier, you couldn't point out that there are potential costs. The very idea of doing a cost-benefit analysis was verboten. Right? I make the joke where they say, uh, you don't believe COVID is real. And I said, of course, COVID is real. It's a real virus. But you don't believe that cost-benefit analyses are real. 
And so this has been a problem. What kind of view, unless you've sort of been pulled into a cult, doesn't consider the costs as well as the benefits? It's a completely mind-boggling thing, and it's exactly what happened last March. Now, related to this, sort of the other side of the same coin, and this might be number four or five, I don't know what number we're on now, is that you treat the one cost, in this case, death by, or usually it's death with, death by COVID, as the cost, the thing, the one thing that should be minimized. So the optimization problem, sort of from a mathematical point of view, is what can we do in society to minimize this one particular thing? Which is another way of saying that you're not doing a cost-benefit analysis, which has to include everything. They've given infinite weight to one particular measure at the expense of everything else. This is just what a death cult is. A death cult is one that's extremely focused on one thing, and that one thing could be a good hit, you know, all by itself might be great. You know, but if you start to say all of society should be centered around, let's say, maximizing the number of apples that are grown, that's a death cult, because you know what happens when you start to maximize the number of apples that are grown, and everything gets pushed towards that? Well, everything else will deteriorate and go to crap. Health, lives, you know, the biggest sort of deaths that you've ever seen on Earth um, ever before. Not because apples per se are bad. Minimizing COVID deaths, also not bad. But it becomes a death cult when it gets infinite weight, and that's exactly what we saw. Another feature that you'll find amongst the COVID hysterical is that not only are they wrong, um, usually about the data, but they're astronomically wrong. When you, when you ask these folks um, what's the percentage of the population that has died of COVID, even last July in the United States, the median respondent said that 9% of the United States was already dead from COVID. 9%. The average, the actual numbers were, you know, 250, 500 times lower than that. And that's the with COVID, not even by, you know, let's just presume that's of COVID. So these are astronomically wrong estimates. When uh, Australians were asked, what's the infection fatality rate of COVID? What's the average, you know, it actually exponentially changes from kids to adults, but still, what's the average? The answer, the average answer was 38%. That is, they believed that if you get COVID, you have a 38% chance of dying. The actual overall infection fatality rate is more on the order of 0.2%, maybe 0.15% even. Again, astronomically wrong, walking around with astronomically wrong estimates about how dangerous the virus is. And another thing we talked about before, another case is that of those who support the notion that the interventions work, lockdowns, shutdowns, mask mandates, and so forth, of those that believe that they work, there ought to be two kinds of people. The folks that, well, I, we all believe that they work, but I think we should do them. And, and then Fred over there says, well, but I think that they're immoral and we shouldn't do them. But there's almost nobody who thinks that these interventions work and also believes that you, should, that you shouldn't do them. Where are those people? It's one of the possibilities in the space, we talk about this two, two by two matrix, of those that believe the interventions work, every single one of them that we ever hear about are the ones that you thought, and we ought to do them. Where's the ethical question about whether you're allowed to do them, whether it's right, whether we have the, uh, uh, you know, the right, or the ability, the government should be allowed to do this at all. There is no one in that position. Why is there this completely empty space within the possibility of, of stances that one can have? That's another kind of signal that there's something deeply wrong with the narrative, the mainstream narrative. And a final one, and I'm sure I, as, as I finish this, I'm going to think of several dozen more. Only one side wants to silence the other side. The mainstream narrative, those who are on the side of that COVID is disproportionately dangerous and all of these interventions super work and ought to be done, um, are exactly the folks that are trying to censor the other side and silence us and feel justified, happily justified to do so. They're the same folks who are happy to see the unvaccinated lose their jobs. They're happy to see them confined to their homes. They deserve it. This kind of is completely asymmetrical. In fact, in our view, the vaccinated have their own risks as well because they in fact transmit it, as we've learned from uh, the data, that they're transmitting just as well and the unvaccinated transmit. So you could make the argument, well, there's, you know, there's, there's risks to have the vaccine. But no, none of us on our side are gonna suggest that vaccinated be, should be treated as second class citizens or distinguished in any kind of way. But the litmus test for free expression is enough, is all that you really need to know. Only one side believes that the other side 
should be silenced. That again tells you there's a deep asymmetry between these narratives. Right. Happy to see in the comments uh, section more of these uh, signs that seem to point that one is in a mass hysteria. And I'd like to put together you know, a, a nice little uh, piece on dozens of these things. And that was your science moment.